Hello everybody and welcome to the Parsha Puppet Show. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Vayishlach. Vayishlach Yaakov Malachim. And Yaakov sent angels, El Esav Achiv, to Esav his brother. Yaakov had finally returned after many, many years of living by his uncle Lavan in the land of Haran. And now Hashem had told him to bring back his whole family. He had come back with 11 sons and four wives. And he was coming back to Eretz Canaan to hopefully be reunited with his family. But first he had to confront his brother who was still angry that Yaakov had taken the brachas from him all those years ago. And now let's go see what our co-host Chaim is up to. Hi, everybody. Hi, Chaim. How are you doing today? Ch- uh, Chaim, um, yeah, I, I think we better get out of here. It looks like some dangerous characters. W- where are you taking us, Chaim? Ah, I- I'm taking you, actually. I-, I decided that the perfect setting for this week's Parsha Puppet Show would be to go visit a biker gang. A biker gang? Oh, that's right. What are, you t- what are you looking at? Oh boy, these guys look tough. Uh, hello, um, would you like to learn about Hashem and the Torah and the mitzvahs? What are you talking about, kid? We want to ride our Harleys. Oh, you have a Yitzhah Harley, right? Uh, what's a Yitzhah what? Oh, Chaim, uh, excuse me, sir. Let, let me just deal with this puppet a minute. Chaim, what exactly are you thinking over here? Why are you bringing us... Over here to this biker gang. What are you, these guys are tough guys. Well, in the Pasha, Yaakov Avinu also met with tough guys. Yaakov Avinu met with tough guys? You mean Esav and his 400 men? Yeah. Okay, so we don't have to do that. Uh, what, you want to fight with these guys? No, no, no. Yo, someone want to fight. We like to fight. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just one second, one second. <laughs> Silly puppet over here, you're going to get us in big trouble. What, what are you thinking? Okay, Chaim, I think we better get back to learning the Pasha, and let's leave the biker gangs uh, to ride their gates of Harleys, okay? Uh, okay. Hi, Chani, how you doing? Baruch Hashem, Rabbi Maxwell, Baruch Hashem. Uh, today was a pretty good day in that school. I learned about the Pasha. Oh, that's wonderful. That's really, really nice. Chani, I hear someone's knocking at the door. Uh, Who's there? Come in. Oh, hi, Feige. How are you? Oh, Chani, hi. Uh, I came uh, with a present for you. A present? A a present? You got me a present? No, it's a present from your servant, Chaim. From my servant, Chaim? Uh, Yes, he sent me to send this present to find favor in your eyes. What is going on over here? What present? Here you go. A beautiful pearl necklace. A, a pearl necklace? Wow. Th- th- that is really beautiful, Feggy. Are you sure that's for me? Yep. Gotta go now. Bye-bye. Uh, Rabbi Waxel, what is going on over here? What on earth has got into that brother of mine? He sent me a pearl necklace? My servant, Chaim? This is very strange. Um, Chani, I think someone's knocking at your door again. Ah, uh, come in. Uh, oh, uh, hi, Sarala. What's going on? Ah, uh, I bought you a present. You bought me a present? Yes, it's from, let me guess, from my servant, Chaim? Yeah, how did you know? Oh, boy, what is this present? Here you go, a beautiful special gift box. Wow, really, really nice. It's so heavy, I gotta put it down. Uh, anyway, gotta go now. What, what, what is going on over here? What on earth is my brother Chaim up to? Oh, I hear the door again. Oh, look, it's the baby. Uh, hi. Hi, baby. What do you have over there? Uh, go, go, kaga. Uh, Chaim, your servant, bring gift, night, nice nightlight for you. What? A night light? Oh, bye-bye. Gotta go now. What is going on? What is my brother trying to do? 
come in and ah hi honey Chaim what is going on over here what is the meaning of all of these presents and messengers that you're sending saying they're coming from your servant Chaim ah <laughs> well I thought you would like those presents I like those presents. Yeah, they're, they're very, very pretty, very beautiful. What is the matter with you, Chaim? Is everything okay? Well, I was hoping to find favor in your eyes, like in the parsha, Yaakov uh, we had to meet Esav, and he knew that Esav uh, was not going to be so happy to see his brother who took his brachas, so he sent a lot of presents. Uh-oh. Chaim, what did you do? Why am I going to be upset at you and you're trying to make me feel better? Uh, how did you know that I did anything? Um, a lucky guess. Chaim, tell me right now, what did you do? Uh, well, I sort of borrowed your bike without permission. What? And I left it outside the grocery store and I came out and it wasn't there anymore. And then, what? Chaim, <laughs> uh, how could I be angry at you? You bought me a pearl necklace. You bought me a gift box. You bought me a nightlight. Ah, oh, I guess your trick from the Parsha really worked, Chaim. Do you forgive me? Yes, but never take my things without asking again. Wow, Chaim, that was a great application of a lesson that you learned in the Parsha. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Wagshaw. <laughs> okay, so why don't we tell the kids all about what you learned about in the Parsha. Well, it all started, you see. Yaakov came back to Eretz Canaan and he knew his wicked brother Esav would be coming. Yeah, so he sent messengers, Malachim, the Torah says, and according to the Medrash, they were Malachim, Mamish, real angels, and they went to see what Esav was up to. And they found out that Esav was coming with a welcoming party. And not exactly a welcoming party. He was coming with 400 men to come and chas v'shalom hurt Yaakov. But Yaakov did, trusted in Hashem and he prepared himself with three ways. That's right, guys. Yaakov prepared himself three different ways because he trusted that Hashem was going to take care of him. He had to do his part. Wow. Yes, I guess that's very special. If Yaakov chas v'shalom, if a person doesn't trust Hashem, maybe they will just not want to do anything or just run away or be scared. But Yaakov trusted, so that's why he made all these plans. That's right. Do you guys remember what Yaakov did first? He divided up everyone into two groups. That's right. Do you remember why? Oh, uh, my Mara taught us in school that he said if Esau will attack one group, then the other group can run away. That's correct. And what did Yaakov do next? He davin to Hashem, please Hashem, katanti, I feel small, mikala hasadim, from all the kindness that you've done to me, your servant Yaakov. I came across the Yardin River with just a stick and now I have two big camps of family and, and servants and maidservants and animals and shepherds. Yes, Yaakov felt very, very blessed by all that Hashem gave him and he said, hmm, maybe Hashem gave me so much, how could I ask Hashem to do more for me, to do miracles for me, to save me from my wicked brother Esau? But didn't Hashem promise Yaakov that he would take care of him? Hashem did tell Yaakov that, but Yaakov did not rely on him being a tzaddik and Hashem promising him things. Yaakov said that Hashem doesn't owe him anything, he just wants Hashem to be kind for no reason because he doesn't believe that he is worthy of Hashem's kindness. He knows that Hashem gives us so much kindness and it's not right to demand from Hashem anything. Oh, interesting. So Yaakov stayed there that night and the Torah says his third 
preparation after he divided up his camp into two and then Daven to Hashem, he got ready some really, really nice looking gifts, presents. Oh, that's where Chaim got it from. Did he get pearl necklaces? No, not exactly. I heard that he got a lot of animals. Animals? Why would Esau want animals? Yeah, well, don't forget, in those days, animals were very valuable. You know, you traded animals for things instead of money. Animals were very important, and you had uh, big herds of animals to get wool and to get milk. Okay, okay. And he sent the animals in such a way that made Esav really, really excited. First of all, he sent 200 female goats and with them 20 male goats. And then he sent 200 female sheep and 20 rams and 30 nursing camels and their young. 40 cows and 10 bulls. And 20 donkeys. Whoa! That was a lot of animals. But he didn't send them all at once, right? No, he did not. He did what Chaim did. He sent them one by one, gift by gift. First he sent the goats, and then he spread them out. So Aesop saw them coming, and he said, wow. And the shepherds with them were asked, who do these belong to? And they said, oh, these are from your servant Yaakov. He has come to find favor in your eyes. Oh, that's why you said your servant Chaim, you silly brother. <laughs> I really pay attention in Parsha class. Yes, you do. And then he sent the next group after them to come. As soon as Esau finished seeing the first group, he saw another and another and another, each one with a day's space in between them. And Esau was so amazed by all of these amazing presents. So he would finally feel love towards his brother. What? So Yaakov thought that Esau is just going to forget his hatred and love him all of a sudden? Well, Yaakov sent this present to hope that Hashem would use this as a way of calming Esau's anger. But of course, Yaakov also relied on another message that he sent Esau. And what was the message? Yaakov sent the message with the Malachim, Im Lavan Garti, I lived with Lavan. Uh, okay, isn't that obvious? Well, our rabbis tell us that the word Garti has the word tough. Reish Yud Gimel inside it, if you rearrange Garti. And Taf Reish Yud Gimel is Gematria Taryag 613. Ah, like the 613 mitzvahs. That's right. And Yaakov's secret message to Esav was, Esav, Hashem is on my side. Even though I was with the wicked Lavan, I kept all 613 mitzvahs and... I am coming with the power of the mitzvahs that I kept, and you will not be able to beat me. So you should make peace with me. Oh, interesting. Hey, Rabbi Wax, shall I have another question? Another question? What's your question, Chaim? Well, wh why did Yaakov say, Katanti, I am very small? What did he mean by that? Very good question, Chaim. To answer that question, I will tell you a little story. Oh, I love stories. Many, many years ago, there was a great Hasidic rabbi named Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, known to his followers as the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe? Oh, of course I have heard of the Alter Rebbe. He wrote a very holy book, Sefer, called the Tanya. That is right. Actually, around this time of year, on the 19th day of Kislev, is a big, big holiday for the Chabad Hasidim. It's a very special day that they celebrate like Rosh Hashanah, the Rosh Hashanah of Hasidus. Right, I heard, because on that's the day the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, got out of jail. What? Why was he in jail? Why, a rabbi goes to jail? Well, Chani, that's the whole story. The story was that there were some people that were not acting very, very nice. And they did not like the fact that Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi was teaching new teachings 
and they were trying to make trouble for him just because their Yetzirahara was convincing them that they were doing a good thing and they didn't really listen to the Yetzir Taiv and come and try to learn from Rabbi Schneir Zalman and see that his teachings were really, really halik and really special. And they made a lie to the Russian king of that time and they said that Rabbi Schneir Zalman was trying to help the king's enemy, the country of Turkey. Uh, turkey? Oh, we just had Thanksgiving. We ate turkey. Oh, I am not that type of a turkey. That country called Turkey, you know, in the Middle East. Oh, yeah, near uh, Eretz Yisrael. Yes, because at that time, actually it was true, there were Yidin and Hasidim that had gone to Eretz Yisrael, which was being controlled by the country of Turkey that had a king called a sultan. Okay. And that king was at war with the king of Russia. And the Alter Rebbe was not supporting the king of Turkey. He was sending tzedakah money to help the poor Yidin who lived in Eretz Yisrael have food. Oh, so they made up a whole lie. And they said that the money was going to help the king fight the Russians. That's right. So what happened? Well, what happened was, is eventually Hashem made a big mess, and the king and all of the judges realized that it was a big Baba Misa. It was false. Uh, Rabbi Wagshaw, that's a really, really nice story. Um, but what exactly does it have to do with Parshas Vayishlach? Well, it has a lot to do with Parshas Vayishlach. I was coming to that. You see, what happened was, when Rabbi Shneir Zaman of the Adi came out of jail, he was concerned Concerned about what? He was out of jail. He was free. Well, he really loved all Yidin, and he didn't want now that he's out of jail, that it's going to be an excuse for his Hasidim, his followers, to go and make fun and fight against those who did the bad thing of telling the government against Rabbi Shneir Zalman. He wanted just that there should be peace between the Yidin. Oh, that's really special. And he wrote a letter to his Hasidim, and in the letter he quoted Katainti from Parshas Vayishlach. What? Yes, he said, just like Yaakov Avinu said, Katainti Mikola Hasadim, I became small from all the kindness. Rabbi Shneir Zaman told his students that I feel that we should make ourselves humble and small and thank Hashem and not become big shots and yell at those people who are against us. Don't make fun of them. Don't even whistle at them. I whistle at them? You know, like say, ha, 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 and make silly comments to show that, ha, ha, we won. Okay. How does he learn that from Katanti? Well... Ya the Alter Rebbe explains that this is the difference between Yaakov and Esav or Yishmael. When Yaakov, Hashem gives him presents and gives him good things, Yaakov says, Katainti, I don't deserve this. I feel small. I feel humble. I'm not going to show off and be a big shot. But when Yishmael got stuff, Yishmael made himself big. When Esav got stuff, Esav came to Yaakov and he says, we're going to see soon in the parasha, Yeshli Rav, I have a lot of stuff. He was a big shot. He felt proud of all that he had and he thought it was his own success. So the Alter Rebbe said, let's learn from Yaakov Avinu and we're going to be humble and thank Hashem for saving my life and be nice to everyone and not be a show off. Oh, wow, that's so beautiful. Yes, it is. Chaim, what are you doing? Uh, I'm camel wrestling. Come on, you camel. Chaim, Chaim, stop. Leave the camel alone. Chaim, what is going on over here? Why are you wrestling camels over here? We're supposed to be learning about the Parsha. Well, I... That's it. That's just it. I was practicing my wrestling skills. You are practicing wrestling skills? What does wrestling skills have to do with Parshas Vayishlach? Don't you know? There was a big wrestling match in Parshas Vayishlach. I want to be ready in case Esau's Malach comes and attacks me like Yaakov. Why are you fey? 
Oh boy. Okay, Chaim, you better explain this to our uh, viewers over here. Our kids are going to be very confused. We don't want anybody going and starting wrestling camels over here. Uh, well, you see, it all started, Yaakov, after he made his three plans to meet Esav, in the middle of the night, he got up and he helped his family cross over the river Yabaik. And Yaakov ferried over his wives and his children across the river, but he forgot some little jars across, so he went back to get them. And all of a sudden, a man attacked him and was wrestling with him all night. And our rabbis tell us this was not a man, this was a malach, an angel. The angel, the malach, that's in charge of guarding over Esav. Right, Chaim, but why are you practicing wrestling? Well, in case maybe the malach is going to come and try to start up with me, I will be ready for him. Oy vey, Chaim, uh, I think this story that happened with Yaakov is not something that happens to regular people. Malachim don't fall down from Shemaim and start wrestling you. No? No. When you actually have a wrestling match that you need to prepare for, that's not with an angel, that's with yourself. What? I have to wrestle with myself? Let me try. Uh, it doesn't work, I can't wrestle with myself. Actually, you can. Whenever you want to do something that your Yetzer Taiv knows is not good, you have to wrestle with your Yetzer Hara, with your desire to do the wrong thing and get yourself to do the right thing. Oh, that's not easy. Nope, that's harder than wrestling camels. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, and what protects us is learning Torah and doing mitzvahs. That gives us the ability to be stronger than our Yitzhahara. Uh, okay, okay, fine. I guess I'll practice wrestling my Yitzhahara instead of camels. Well, anyway, Chaim, you are right about the storyline, though, even though that's not the way to prepare for it. Yaakov was wrestling with this Malach of Esav, and the whole night they were wrestling and dust was flying until when the sun started to rise, the Malach got worried because all of the Malachim, all of the angels have a job to stay sing songs of praise in front of Hashem at different times and this Malach's time was that morning and he needed to go and so he tried one last trick he gave Yaakov a hit in Yaakov's thigh where his leg connected with his hip and he dislocated the hip of Yaakov out of the socket and there was a nerve over there called the Gid Hanasha that felt a lot of pain by what that angel did. But Yaakov, even though he was in a lot of pain, he did not give in and he continued holding on to the Malach. Oh boy, so what happened? The Malach said, please let me go, the morning has come. I have to go up to Shemaim. And Yaakov said, no, first give me a bracha. And the Malach gave him a bracha and said, What is your name? And Yaakov said, My name is Yaakov. And the Malach said, Hashem will call you soon. Hashem will tell you that your name is not going to be anymore Yaakov, which means to fight with the heel of his brother Esau, because Ekev means heel. And Yaakov came out of his mother's womb holding on to Esau's heel and always struggling against his wicked brother. Now you're going to be named Yisrael, which comes from the word Sar, a leader, a ruler, because you have ruled over Elikim, over Malachim, who are from messengers from Hashem. And you... Why does the Torah tell us all the details about which part of Yaakov's body gets hurt and everything? Well, actually, there's a, there's a mitzvah that we learn from there. Uh, what is it? Well, it's a mitzvah loisa say. It's a mitzvah that you should not do. What are you not allowed to do? Punch people in the hip? Uh, well, that's also something that you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to hurt somebody, that's 100%. But in the laws of kosher, we're not allowed to eat the part, the nerve of the animal, the gid hanasha. You have to take it out. And if you can't take it out, you can't eat that part. It's a very, very special art a rabbi who knows how to do that, it's called Nikor, to take out those veins, and those gidim, those, those uh, nerves, and to remove them from the animal so that 
only the meat will be left. Wow, so why are we not allowed to eat that? Because the Yid didn't say, we will not eat the part that Yaakov got injured by. Ah, very interesting. You know, Chaim, there's a beautiful vart over here that the vart over here is this story represents the story of the Jewish people in the times of Golas, in the times of exile. How so? Well, during the times of Golas, we struggle, like the Yaakov wrestling with this Malach, and sometimes we even get injured, and it looks like we're really, really going to fall down. But in the end, we, Hashem gives us strength to be strong, and in the end, Yaakov was completely healed. The Torah says when Yaakov came to Shechem, he was completely whole, his body had healed, everything had healed, and he did not even feel any more any pain from his hip. And that reminds us that when Mashiach will come very soon, all the pain of the Golos that we went through will disappear, and we will be together with Hashem in Simcha and a whole and happy heart. Wow, that's beautiful. I wonder where Chaim is. It's getting late. Uh, hi, Ma. Hi, Mommy. Uh, hi, Chaim. Why are you home so late? Mommy, you're the greatest. Mommy, I love you. Mommy, you're wonderful. Mommy. Uh, Chaim, what is with all this bowing? You. Okay, that was seven times, right? Seven times? Chaim, what is going on over here? Uh, well, I uh, learned in the parsha that when Yaakov met Esav, he bowed seven times. But I'm your mother, not Esav. Uh, well, um, I just wanted you to uh, not be angry at me like Esav was angry at Yaakov. Why would I be angry, Chaim? What did you do now? Uh, well, you didn't see my report card yet. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, there's some things I need to improve in, so I, you know, I got some comments from my Rebbe. <coughs> Chaim, don't worry. Don't worry, I still love you. We will help you to get better on your report card. No need to bow seven times like Yaakov did to Esav. Thank you, Mommy, thank you. So let's tell the kids, Chaim, the story of how Esau and Yaakov finally met after so many years. It was 20 years, right? Well, actually, it was more than 20 years. It was seven years for Rachel and seven years for Leah and another six years for the sheep. That is 20. But our rabbis tell us that Yaakov also spent 14 years learning at the yeshiva of Shem and Ever. Whoa, that's a lot of years. That's right. And you would think his brother calmed down a little bit, right? Not Esav. Not Esav. And Esav was coming, and Yaakov took his children, and he made them all come, divided them up, put the maidservants and their children, Bila and Zilpa, together with Don Naftali, God and Asher, in the front. And behind them he put Leah and her six sons, and then he put Yosef and Rachel in the back. And Yosef went in front of his mother because he didn't want his mother to be seen by Esav. Why not? Well, Yosef was trying to protect his mother from the wicked Rasha looking at her and maybe wanting to steal her for his own wife. Oh, wow. Wait a minute. What happened to Dina? Ah, Dina. Well, our rabbis tell us that Dina was inside a box. Inside of a box? Our rabbis tell us that Yaakov was a little bit worried that his brother Esav might see Dina and like her and ask to marry her. Uh, what? Yes, Yaakov did not want Esav to marry Dina. And actually, we're going to see later, because of this, Yaakov was punished. A wicked person did marry Dina in the end. What? Really? Well, our rabbis tell us that Dina could have changed Esau into a good person because a good wife has the ability to transform even a bad person to be good. Wow. But Dina was not allowed to marry Esau and therefore Esau was in a way not able to have that opportunity to do teshuva. 
uh, anyway. So Yaakov went in front of all of them, and yes, just like you acted out over there with your mother and the report card, he bowed down seven times to his brother Esav. And Esav, his mercy was aroused that he saw Yaakov bowing so many times in all of the presents. He ran towards Yaakov and he fell on his neck. He fell on his neck. Uh Uh-oh, was he trying to kill him? (laughs) Well, some Midrashim say that that's what he had in mind. But actually the Torah says he hugged him and he kissed him and they cried together. Whoa, that was not expected? No, it was not expected. Although if you look in the Torah, on the words, Vayishakeyu, when he kissed him, there are little dots that are put in there, that are a special tradition to put in there. And what does that mean? Rashi tells us that one, some say that he didn't kiss him with all of his heart. He kissed him with still a bad feeling inside of his heart. He was just doing it outside. Okay, and what do other rabbis say? Well, there's another rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who says that he kissed him. At that time, Hashem made him kiss him with all of his heart, even though normally it's a halacha that Esav hates Yaakov. But this time, because of all of the things that Yaakov did, Hashem blessed that Esav was transformed for that time. Oh, wow. So Esav asked Yaakov, who are all these people? How are they related to you? And Yaakov said, these are the children that Hashem has graciously given your servant. And then they all met? That's right. They all came and they bowed and they met. And then Esav asked a big question. What is all these presents that you sent me? And Yaakov said, they were to find favor in my master's eyes. And Esav said, ah, yes, Rav, I got a lot of stuff. You take your own stuff. Ah, Esav was very rich, huh? Was he showing off? Well, yes, that's how Esav talked. I got a lot. But Yaakov said, yes, they call. I have everything I need. He wasn't showing off. He wasn't saying how much he had. He said, I have everything I need. You take this gift. And finally, Yaakov pressured his brother, and Esav took it. And Esav still wanted to be nice and show that he was nice to Yaakov. So he said, Yaakov, come, I will go slowly with you, and you'll come with me to my home in Seir. And Yaakov did not want his family to be going with Esav and his wicked men. So Yaakov said, no, 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 not a good idea. I have little Shepsalach, little sheep that are very weak, and little children. They can't go fast like your men on their... uh, animals they have to go slow so you go fast and we'll come i'll come to say here one day oh really but i don't think yakov ever went to say here that's right so was yakov not saying the ms the truth i thought yakov always said the ms very good point chaim actually our rabbis tell us that yakov was hinting to esav I'm not going to come with you now, but in the future, a Mashiach comes. It says, For all who Mashiach, Bahar Tzion, the Shpoit Es Har Esav, the redeemers are going to, are going to come on Har Tzion, the Mount of Tzion, to judge the Mount of Esav, which is Seir. And that is when Yaakov and his descendants will come with Mashiach to judge Esav and Seir. Oh, wow. So it's going to come true. Yes, because Yaakov always says the MS. So Yaakov continued going on, and he came 18 months of traveling later. He went to Sukkot, and he made himself a house, and he made Sukkot huts for his cattle and his other possessions. And our rabbis tell us he was traveling for 18 months, and he came to Shechem, and he settled outside the city, and he bought a piece of land for a price of a hundred coins called Kesita. And he built a Mizbeach to thank Hashem for all of the miracles that Hashem had made for him. Oh, wow! Ah, 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 ah. Chaim, why are you out of, the, out of breath? What's the matter? Ha, honey, I, I, I got your bike back. What? Why are you out of breath? What happened? And how did you get my bike back? Well, I remember I told you it got stolen earlier, right? Uh, yeah. Well, what happened? 
Well, I found a thief. You found a thief? Yeah, he just went and he took the bike and I said, hey, that's my bike, my sister's bike. And he said, oh, well, I would really like the bike. Can you let me keep it? So, how did you get it back? Well, I realized that this guy is a big, uh, tough guy and I'm not going to be able to just get it back from him. He's not going to give it back to me. So what did you do? Well, I uh, made a trick on him. You made a trick on him? What kind of trick? I told him, sure, he could have the bike if he just has a little race with me. A little race? Yeah, he has to catch me. Uh, I'll be on the bike and he has to catch me. Uh, uh oh, this sounds a little crazy. And I drove the bike very quickly, and even though he was a fast runner, I had a plan. I knew that very close by was the police station, and I made him go very fast, and I drove quickly to the police station, and the police caught him, the big bad bike thief of the town, and they put him in the jail, and the police are going to bring back your bike very soon. What? What a crazy story! Oh, yeah, Chaim. Oh, hi, officer. Chaim, good job there. You caught the notorious bike thief of the town. Thank you, Chaim. You're a brave kid. Ah, you're welcome, officer. I was just learning from the Parsha. Just learning from the Parsha? Yeah, Chaim, what are you talking about? Uh, Well, actually, in the Parsha of this week, Shimon and Levi, two of the Shvatim, two of the sons of Yaakov, had to deal with a very bad thief also, and they made a plan to outsmart him. What? What happened? Yaakov and his sons camped in Shechem, and they were living there. Dina, their sister, went out for a walk one day to go and see the girls of the land. Okay. A wicked man named Shechem, the son of Hamar. The son of Hamar? Doesn't Hamar mean a donkey? Yeah, I don't know. It's pretty funny how they named people in those days. But the ruler of the city was named Hamar, and his son Shechem... Wait a minute. The city was named Shechem. Yeah, the city was named Shechem. And the prince of the city, the son of the ruler, named Shechem, was a really wicked and rotten person, a real thief who took whatever he wanted. Uh Uh-oh, I don't like the sound of this. And he saw Dina and he said, Ooh, look at that nice girl. I don't see her around here. Maybe she would make a wonderful wife for me. And he just grabbed her and kidnapped her. And Dina did not want to go with him, said, Stop! I have to go home to my father Yaakov and my brothers. And Shechem would not listen. He took her as a prisoner in his house. And then Shechem had such a chutzpah, just like Chaim's story that he found the thief. Well, Shechem just went to his daddy Chamor. And he was so spoiled, Shechem. He said... Chamor, my father, could you go ask Yaakov if he will give me Dina to keep as a wife? And Chamor listened to his son. And listen to this. They just came to Yaakov and said, Oh yes, we've stolen your sister Dina, your daughter Dina, sorry. And Yaakov didn't know what to say. What a crime, what a terrible thing. And he waited for the Shvatim, for his sons to come home. And Shimon and Levi, they realized that they were dealing with a real bad people. Not only were they bad, but all the people of their town were bad because they would allow such a terrible crime to happen and they would not even stop it. There were no laws over there. Oh boy. So what, 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 did, what did Shimon and Levi do? They made a plan, a tricky plan. They told Shechem and Chamor, Oh, we're so sorry. You can't marry our sister. We are the people of Israel. The Bnei Israel only have a bris milah. We can not join with you. You're not like us. A bris milah is a special way that we show we're connected to Hashem. If you don't have a bris milah, we cannot let our sister marry you. 
and Shechem and Hamar got all excited. They said, oh, that's all we have to do, a little bris milah, no problem. And they went and they convinced all the people of their city to have a bris milah so that they would be able to marry the girls of the family of Yaakov and get all their business and all their money. And that was what they were thinking. But Shimon and Levi had another plan. That's right. On the third day, when the people of Shechem were feeling very sick, like Avram Avinu, the third day after his bris milah, Shimon and Levi came with their swords, and they, and they, what did they do? Well, they punished all of the wicked people of Shechem, who went along with these terrible crimes and they killed Hamar and Shechem and they took all of the women and the children back with them who were not people that would fight and they took all of their possessions from this town and they all the bro- other sons of Yaakov came to join them as well afterwards when they found out what? what did Yaakov say? well actually Yaakov was not even asked by Shimon and Levi, and Yaakov was very upset. And he told them, how could you do this? Now all the people of the land will fight against us. And Shimon and Levi said, well, how could we let our sister be captive by these terrible people? And Hashem told Yaakov, don't worry, go to Beiskel and build a Mizbeach, an altar to thank Hashem, like you promised to do when you left Canaan. <coughs> Rabbi Parsha, what are you doing? <coughs> oh, hi, Rabbi Waxel. Uh, I'm digging over here by this tree. You're digging by the tree. What are you digging for? Well, here in Shechem, we have these trees that don't give fruit, and I'm digging to find the buried treasure. Excuse me. <coughs> buried treasure? Rabbi Parsha, what are you talking about? Don't you know, in the parsha, Yaakov Avinu takes his family and leaves Shechem. And he tells them, not so fast. Everybody take off all of this fancy clothes that you took from Shechem. Take off all the gold and the silver jewelry and give it to me. Because it's all full of idols and idol worship. And I don't want it to be with us, with our holy family. Ah, that's right. Taira says that Yaakov Avinu buried it by a tree that didn't give fruit. Yeah, you see? So, that's why I'm digging by this tree here. Maybe the treasure is there. Oy, but Rabbi Pasha, Yaakov buried it because he didn't want anyone to find it because it was uh, things that were used for idol worship. Oh, okay. Maybe I should stop digging. Yeah, I think you should. Besides, there's a lot of trees here. I don't think you're going to find it. Uh, okay, okay. That's it. That's it. Hi, Sarala. What's the matter? I decided to change my name. To change your name? Why would you change your name? I'm going to change my name to Chevy. To Chevy? What's wrong with Sarala? It's such a pretty name. It's the name of Sarah Imenu. Well, that girl in my class, Chevy, she's so smart. She always wins all the competitions. So I figure that people named Chevy are smart. So I want to change my name to Chevy. I fault. Oh, you face, Sarala. Where did you get this idea from? Ah, from the Parsha. From the Parsha? Where did you get the idea that you change your name and you become smarter? Well, didn't you know when Yaakov Avinu uh, went to Beiskel, he built a... He came over there to a place of Luz and he built a Mizbeach for Hashem to thank Hashem. And there uh, they got the news that the Vaira, the nurse of Rivka, who had come to tell them that Rivka said it was safe to come back to Eretz Canaan now, had passed away. That's right, that's right. And the Medrash also says that Rivka passed away at the same time. And Yaakov actually, at that place, they all cried and they sat, like they sat Shiva. When someone passes away, they cry over the person that passed away. And then the Torah says Hashem came to Yaakov and our rabbis say that actually Hashem was doing the mitzvah of Nichom Avelim, comforting someone who has someone in their family that passed away. 
Yeah, and Hashem tells Yaakov, don't worry Yaakov, I'm going to give you this land, and your name is not going to be Yaakov, which means to fight with your brother, it's going to be Yisrael, the ruler. So you see, if you change your name, you could become great. It's in the Pasha. Ay vey, Sarah, that doesn't work that way. Yaakov Avinu worked very, very hard for many, many years to deserve to have a special name given by Hashem. He didn't just change a name and uh, that's what happened. It was a gift, a bracha that Hashem gave him. You have to work hard and I'm sure with your name Sarala, you can do a lot of wonderful things if you really try hard. It's not about the name, it's about the person that is working as hard as they can. Okay, okay. Rabbi Waxel, what happened next? Did Hashem tell Yaakov anything else? Yes, Hashem blessed Yaakov that many, many nations will come from him. And our rabbis tell us this refers to Ephraim and Manasseh, which came from Yosef, which were considered, we'll see later why, to be part of Yaakov's own children. And also, Hashem told Yaakov that kings will come from you. Kings? That's right. From the next child to be born, Binyamin, came the first two kings of the Yidin, King Shaul, and then there was another king that was for a very short time named Ishboishes. He was before David HaMelech, and these two kings came from Shevet Binyamin that was born after Hashem gave Yaakov this blessing. Wow! And Yaakov put a monument, he put up a stone like he promised, and he poured wine and an oil offering on it, and he named it Beiskel, the house of Hashem. And this was the keeping of his promise that he made when he went to, down to Haran. Wow, amazing! But wait a second, if Yaakov's name was changed, how come sometimes in the Torah we call him Yaakov even afterwards? Great question. I heard an answer. Can I say? Can I say? Yeah, please say, Sarala. The answer that I heard is that Yaakov and Yisrael are both two ways for a Yid to serve Hashem. Please explain, Sarala. Yaakov is when we fight with our Yitzhahara, like fighting with the Ekev, with the heel, and struggling. And that is very important in the eyes of Hashem, and we all have to do it. Ah, and Yisrael is when a Yid beats his Yitzhahara and he is attached to his Neshama, his soul, and he rules over his Yitzhahara and he succeeds. And both of these ways are important. Sometimes we have to beat our Yitzhahara and it's very hard. And sometimes we are only following our Yitzhah Taiv and learning Torah and doing mitzvahs and ruling over the Yitzhahara. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sarala. Well, Sarala and Khani, I want to show you a very, very special place. And where? Here we are, Kever Rachel, the burial place of Rachel Imenu. Wow, it, it, it's so beautiful. Wait, wait a second, Rabbi Waxel. The burial place of Rachel Imenu? Rachel Imenu wasn't buried together with Yaakov and, and the other Avais? No, Khani, didn't know that? Rachel Imenu passes away in our parsha. Ay, what happened? Well, what happened, Chani and Sarla, was that she was pregnant with Binyamin, and the baby was being born, and it was very difficult for her, and she felt her neshama was passing away, and the nurse, the midwife who was delivering the baby said, don't be afraid, this is another son, you wanted another son, so you're going to have the twelfth of the twelve Shvatim, and you got it. And Rachel gave the baby the name Ben Oini, the son of my suffering. But Yaakov called the baby Binyamin, the son of the south, because he was born in Canaan in the south. Oh, very interesting. And yeah, Yaakov didn't want him to have such a name, son of suffering. And Rachel passed away and was buried over there because they were traveling and they were not yet at Ephras where they were going. They passed away and, and she passed away and Yaakov buried her on the, on the side of the road. 
in a place where now it's called Beis Lechem. Wait, wait, wait a minute, so, but, but, but why? Why not take her to Hebron like all the other Aves and Imais were buried? Very good question, because many years later, we found out the answer why. Why, Rabbi Wagshel? Hashem wanted Yaakov to bury Rachel there on the road because when the Yidin were leaving Eretz Yisrael after the first base on Mikdash was destroyed, they went and davened by Rachel Imenu's burial place. And Rachel Imenu went up to Shemayim and asked Hashem to forgive the Yidin just like she forgave her sister Leah who took Yaakov and married him instead. And she gave up the secret codes as we learned about to marry, to let her sister marry ya- Yaakov she told Hashem, Hashem don't be upset, don't be jealous that the Yidin worshipped idols they shouldn't have done that but if I could forgive my sister, you could forgive the Yidin and Hashem said, you're right and Hashem told Rachel, because of you the Yidin will come and back to Eretz Yisrael and have another Beis HaMikdash in your honor because of your tefillahs. And that is a reason brought down why Yaakov was told by Hashem to bury Rachel right there. Wow, amazing. Uh, Chaim, what's going on? What are you doing over there? Isn't that your parents' room? You're not supposed to go in there. Well, I'm making a protest over here. I- I'm not going to let my father go to his room. What? Ch- Chaim, this is not very respectful behavior. Where did you get this idea? What are you doing? Well, in the Pasha, we learned that Ruvain uh, was protesting and he moved his father's bed from the, te- from the tent of Bilha to the tent of Leah. Oy vey. Yes, Chaim, yes. Why? That's true. Yaakov Avinu, after Rachel passed away, moved his bed from Rachel's tent, which that was his favorite wife, and he moved it instead to Rachel's maidservant, Billa. And Ruvain protested and said, my mother is the older sister. She should be honored that Yaakov should put his bed in her room. And he moved the bed, and the Torah speaks about him in a very strict way, that he did a not good thing. But he really had in mind for a good reason. And the Torah then says that Yaakov had 12 children, and our rabbis say that 12 of them were righteous. Even Reuven did teshuva for what he did, and he had the right intentions. But Chaim, what's up with your protest over here? What exactly are you protesting? Well, my father used to read me stories every night, and now... Uh, lately, he's been very tired from his new job at work, and he has no time, so I want to make a protest and not let him go to his room until he reads me a story. Chaim, I think you shouldn't be making protests against your father. I think he's really tired. I think that maybe you should instead show kibbutz of the aim and ask your father how you could help and maybe earn an extra story when he has some more energy. Okay, okay. Ruvain Shemayn Levi Yehuda Yisachar Zavulam B'nei Leia Chani, what on earth are you singing? Uh, it's a song I'm uh, studying for my Pasha test. The Torah lists all of the, all of the sons of all of the Imais. Those were the sons of Leia. Ruvain Shemayn Levi Yehuda Yisachar Zavulam B'nei Leia Okay. Dan Naftali B'nei Bila Kad Asher Pene Zilpa Ole Rachel Shnei Banim Yai Seif Obinyamin E Lu Hashvatim Shel Yakai Vavinu. Oh, wow, what a cool song! What a really cool song! So, Reuven, Shem, and Levi, Yehudi, Yisachar, Zvulan were the sons of Leah, and Dan Naftali were the sons of Bilha, the servant of Rachel, and God, Asher, were the sons of Zilpah, the servant of Leah. And finally, Rachel, at the end, after Dina was born, of course, had Yosef and Benjamin. That's right. Great song. Well, boys and girls, the end of Parshas Vayishlach just mentions all of the children of Esav and... Hey, wait a minute. Whoa, who are you? 
It's me, Asav. Asav, what are you doing here? This is my time to shine, don't you know? Your time to shine? Well, the Torah says in the end of Parshas Vayishlach, all about the history of Asav. Yeah, I was a son of Yitzchak and a grandson of Avram too. You know, I deserve some kavay to be mentioned. Okay, so what does the Torah tell us about Esav? The Torah tells us that Yitzchak Avinu passed away at 180 years old, and he was buried after a good long life in Kiryas Arba, which is Hevrain, by Yaakov and Esav. Okay, so what else does the Torah say about you? The Torah says all about my descendants. This is my favorite part of the Torah because it speaks all about Esav and Esav's wives, uh, Ada and Alivama and Basmas. Uh-huh, interesting. And we had a lot of children, Eliphaz, Ruel, Yeosh, Yalam, Kairach, Kairach. Wait a minute, isn't he from... I don't know, maybe they named him after my children. Anyway, uh, I had to leave Eretz Canaan because Yaakov had so many possessions and so many sheep, there wasn't enough room. So we just moved to Har Seir, the Mount of Seir, and I had a lot of children, and I was the father of the nation of Edom. And then the Torah says about all of the kings, eight kings that came from me. Eight kings that came from you. So... What do you think the Torah tells us about the eight kings of Esav? Well, I'll tell you. Because when Rivka, our mother, went to Shem, Shem said that when one brother is on top, the other brother is down. When one brother is down, the other brother is up. Okay. Well, when my descendants were kings, the Yidin didn't have kings. But afterwards, the Yidin took over and they had eight kings. Shaul, Ish, Boishas, David, Shlaima, Rechava, Mavia, Asa, Yeshafat, and Yeshafat's son, Yeram. After eight kings, Edai, my children, rebelled. And that is the meaning of when one is up, the other is down. Well, Chaim, it's almost Shabbos. What are you going to say at the Shabbos table this week? Well, I think this week I'm going to say my favorite verb from the Pasha. Katanti Yaakov Avino said that even though Hashem did so much for me, I feel so small that a Jew should always be humble and thank Hashem for all the kindness and good things that Hashem did for him. Wow, that's wonderful. Good Shabbos. Oh, it's time to say good Shabbos. Cause all your work is done. I'm gonna spend the day together.